she said, you know, your baby has a brain stem, so its heart is beating now, but, um, but, but it's, it's not going to live. And she said, if, if, if they are born alive, these babies live for a couple of minutes, maybe an hour. And I started to think about this baby and what it would like, be like for this baby to be born. Um, and I couldn't imagine it being a very pleasant way to be born and die. So, so I started to think that this probably was a pregnancy we weren't going to continue, that we were going to end early. In Ireland, abortions are permitted only when the mother's life is in danger. So Amy was given a choice. She could be looked after in Ireland until her baby died, or her medical paperwork could be sent to Liverpool, and Amy and her husband Connor could follow that paperwork to the UK for a termination. We were taken care of really well physically, and, and once we explained our situation, the doctors were really, really lovely and kind. Um, and while we were there, we started to think about how we would get Nico's remains home. We got on the flight then back to Dublin. So we were like, now what do we do with Nico? Um, and nobody tells you what you can do, whether there's a place to bury your baby or if there's a place you can get them cremated. Um, so we put Nico in our freezer and Connor was trying to figure out what we could do and nothing felt right. Um, we just felt abandoned by the whole country. We felt like Liverpool looked after us, but that we weren't looked after here. Amy's story is just one in the debate about abortion, but there are so many stories on both sides of the issue. It's a highly emotive and sensitive topic that's dividing the people of Ireland. Welcome to Dublin, Ireland. This is where I was born, where I grew up. This is actually the street that I grew up on. And the reason we are here is because this country is about to go through something momentous. It is about to have a landmark referendum on abortion. The ballot question will be yes or no to repealing the Eighth Amendment, which refers to language that was inserted into the Irish Constitution in 1983, also by referendum. And it gave the unborn the same rights as the mother and made abortion, which was already illegal in the state, also unconstitutional. The campaign is in full swing, as it has been for months. Posters line the streets, rallies are taking place, and there's a steady stream of canvassers that are knocking on doors across the country. And according to all accounts, it is too close to call. Leading the No campaign is Cora Sherlock, a lawyer who believes the right to life for the unborn is a human rights issue. On the 25th of May, we'll be talking about something that would end the life of a baby for any reason up to 12 weeks. So I don't believe that there is any other difficult situation in life, in society, where we advocate ending the life of a human being in order to bring about a positive response. We've been pleading with the government to look at the reasons why women are having abortions um, and to see what can be done to address that, whether their needs are financial, accommodation, um, maternity or paternity uh, leave, those kind of really practical supports and the government has ignored that. The Eighth Amendment was designed to protect both mother and her unborn child and it works. Human rights have been a theme of the No campaign, but in a country like Ireland, many are asking whether their campaign is linked to the history of religion and Catholicism. 35 years ago, when I went to this Catholic, all girls primary school, and most of the schools here are still Catholic, it was very clear from the message that was drilled into us by our educators at the time, that abortion was not only illegal, but also immoral and completely wrong. But looking at Ireland, it is changing. A referendum on marriage equality in 2015 saw it become the first country to legalise gay marriage by popular vote. The Taoiseach, or the Prime Minister of the country, Leo Varadkar, he's a gay man, open about his relationship. And that is different to the Ireland that I grew up in. But why is the Catholic ethos still to the fore for some, even if, as many have said, the church is absent in this debate? In 1922, when, when uh, most of the island gets its independence uh, from Britain, 
one of the most powerful organization and the wealthiest organization within society at that time that controlled healthcare and the education system was the Catholic Church. The government uh, with a treasury that was practically empty was quite willing to let the church uh, continue on as the, the uh, carers within the healthcare system and as the educators. Tara Flynn had an abortion at the age of 37. She's campaigning for yes. When people say to me, you should hear out the other side, you must debate the other side, I, I say, I have heard out the other side. I heard nothing but the other side growing up. I've lived the effects of what the other side uh, engenders. That's what, that's what it engenders is solitude, secrecy, fear, and having to get healthcare elsewhere. And one of the reasons I speak is, the deal here is that you, if you have money you, uh, and you have means and you're physically able that you travel and then you lie. You travel and you pretend it didn't happen. Um, what about the people who don't have the means? I'm finding that the debate on this referendum on both sides is often framed in terms of healthcare. So I wondered, what do the medical professionals in Ireland think? And you probably won't be surprised to find out that there too, it's also divided. Dr. Padder O'Grady is one of the advocates looking to repeal the Eighth Amendment, but other doctors are convinced the opposite outcome is the right one. When a patient, a pregnant woman walks through my door, I have two patients. And Ireland uh, has been a wonderful country in supporting uh, every life, no matter what disability, uh, no matter what the circumstances are, we've always protected women um, and fought uh, to preserve every life. And so a vote no is very important to preserve that. Everyone I've met has been so considered and thoughtful about their opinion, whatever side of the issue that they're on. But I have found that some people are still speaking in whispers, unable to discuss tough issues like abortion openly. And I wonder if May 25th, whatever the outcome, that it might become a catalyst for the people of this country to talk openly to friend and to neighbour and debate what sort of future Ireland that they want to live in.